Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halady. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we speak with nuclear researcher, writer, and speaker Lou Ricciuti on dirty nuclear secrets of Niagara Falls. You'll learn some amazing parallels with what is being experienced in North St. Louis as a result of World War II nuclear weapons waste and its unsupervised illegal disposal. Then we'll talk with veteran anti-nuclear activist Myla Reason about a Diablo Canyon nuclear reactor anniversary this week where attention must be paid. Plus our numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness. The nuclear reactor duck and cover report on what's gone wrong this week with those crumbling rust buckets and more honest nuclear information than the International Olympic Committee is willing to consider now that the Rio Olympics are over and they're stuck with the upcoming 2020 Tokyo radioactive no Olympics. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday. August 23rd, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Starting off in the U.S. with the nuclear reactor duck <laughs> and cover report. Starting out in upstate New York, where word comes that a minor, put that in quotes, radiation leak in the Fitzpatrick nuclear facility has gone unfixed for four years. It's just a little radiation. You're just a little bit pregnant. The justifications are being spewed in all directions. Entergy, the owner of Fitzpatrick, says that the safety violation poses no risk to the public, but it might make it a bit more difficult to decontaminate the site after the reactor closes. Over at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they said the accumulation of spilled radioactive waste in the basement of the building at Fitzpatrick is of, quote, very low safety significance because it occurred in a locked, highly shielded area that is already highly radioactive. In other words, it's already bad, so eh, a little more, and for a penny and for a pound. And Neil Sheehan, Spokesmodel for the NRC and always good for a laugh says, the bottom line is, we have been aware of this issue for some time, but it poses no immediate, spin word alert, spin word alert, no immediate risks to any residents or the environment. The two things the NRC is supposed to be protecting. And Tammy Holden, speaking for Entergy, note how they always pick a woman to deliver the bad news, said, Cleanup of the area had not been conducted previously because we did not want to subject our employees to unnecessary radiation. We have fabricated a vacuum-type robot that will be used to remove the sludge. First time they called it that, sludge, this month. Actions speak louder than words, Tammy. Robots, radioactive sludge. And Fitzpatrick is one of those reactors that's getting subsidies, courtesy Governor Andrew Cuomo and his Clean Energy Initiative. <laughs> From Christine Legere at Cape Cod Times, a stretch of hot water has again affected operations at Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station, marking the third summer out of the last four that the facility has been forced by excessive water temperatures to power down. Pilgrim draws 500 million gallons of water every day from Cape Cod Bay to cool its systems. And its license caps the water intake temperature at 75 degrees Fahrenheit. However, that water can be up to 30 degrees hotter when it returns to the bay, thus allowing for pre-cooked fish, the ones that survive, that is. Michael Lambert director of the citizens group Pilgrim Watch, sees irony in the effect climate change is having on nuclear reactors. He said, the nuclear industry incorrectly claims that nuclear power is the answer to climate change. But climate change brings warmer seawater temperature, and this means that the reactor must shut down when the bay heats up. On the other hand, 
when water temperature gets hot, truly clean sources of electricity, wind, solar, hydro, and tide, operate just fine. In response, some plant owners have successfully applied to raise the federal 75-degree limit for intake water. When in doubt, manage the perception even if you can't handle the problem. <coughs> but only two days later, Pilgrim powered down to full shutdown so that it could figure out the cause of a malfunctioning valve designed to prevent radioactivity from leaking into the environment during a nuclear accident. Just a part of a nuclear reactor that's wearing out the same way your car would wear out if it was run for 44 years, which this reactor has been for more than it was planned when it was originally built, and the part is not being replaced in time because Entergy is planning to permanently shut it down in 2019, trading it in on a big cash bonus. <coughs> At Wolf Creek in Kansas on August 16, all emergency sirens failed. Both the dispatcher and the supervisor were unable to actuate any sirens, either manually or by using the normal computer controls. So if anything went wrong, you wouldn't even know to kiss your posterior goodbye. <coughs> and at Zion in Illinois on August 12th, was it a terrorist attack? No, just two male children walking west on the railroad tracks on the south end of the owner-controlled area of the nuclear facility, approximately 50 yards onto the property, and the children appeared to be between 7 and 10 years of age. Upon noticing that a security officer was noticing them, the children somehow left the property. Industrial security began vehicle and foot patrols to search for the children and ensure that they did, in fact, leave the property. The children were not seen again, but nobody has been able to figure out how they got onto the property of Zion Nuclear in Illinois. Feel safer yet? <coughs> Last week, we reported on an unreported fire at the Savannah River nuclear site in South Carolina. That information came through miningawareness.wordpress.com, and this week it appears that there have been three more fires at the Savannah River nuclear site. They appeared on the U.S. government fire map on August 16, 17, and 18. The fires appear to be in the area of a shipping container of liquid radioactive waste from Canada and other foreign countries. According to Mining Awareness, one can speculate that these fires are most likely from hydrogen or tritium, which is radioactive hydrogen, either accidental or burn off to prevent explosion. What else did and did not escape, we'll surely never know. Lots of links this week. One to a front page story in the Los Angeles Times, rare when it comes to nuclear stories. This about the nuclear accident at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site, in New Mexico, ranking it among the costliest in U.S. history. Mining awareness again on the relationship between catastrophes, regulatory capture, and nuclear, pointing to the ongoing potential of tomorrow's disasters. Over to Japan, where on August 14, members of Japan's ultra-right wing targeted the anti-nuclear power protest tents that have stood for nearly five years outside of the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, or METI, in Kasumi Gaseki, the government district in central Tokyo. The attack took place the day before the annual anniversary of Japan's surrender in the Pacific War. Right-wingers previously damaged and attempted to disrupt the tents as early as 2011, which has led the anti-nuclear protesters to develop a network of supporters who can be mobilized to guard and protect the tents. These counter-protesters strive to outnumber and drown out the noise of right-wing or hate groups' street actions and do not shy away from engaging directly in physical confrontations. But before dawn the very next day, Sunday, August 21st, Tokyo District Court officials removed the activist tents. According to a 53-year-old company employee who had been staying in one of the tents on Saturday since the first one was erected in September of 2011, the government is pushing through the reactivation of nuclear power plants without taking
taking responsibility for the Fukushima crisis, we will carry on with our protests. CCTV Channel 17 in Burlington, Vermont, posted an extended interview with Maggie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education, she's the founder and CEO, regarding the chief engineer at Fairwinds, Arne Gunderson, and his work with Japanese scientists who are studying and evaluating samples that were taken in Japan. According to Maggie, quote, they're finding astronomical amounts of radiation even in downtown Tokyo outside of Meiti's door. Remember, Meiti is the regulatory agency over nuclear power in Japan. Maggie said, when he, meaning Arnie, and the others were downtown in Tokyo, they took samples right there in the garden, right outside the door and on the front doormat, and these are really, really high samples. It's frightening because people walking in Tokyo will then be inhaling that dust. And an article in Gendai Business Online cited Arne Gunderson and his shock and sadness when a group of young girls in the city of Miname Soma rode their bikes to school directly past him. He said, What surprised me at this visit to Japan is that the decontaminated area is contaminated again. I had thought that we would not find such high doses of radiation in the decontaminated area, but sadly, our results proved otherwise. That was the area that the young girls were bicycling through. Last week, three cyclones were on track to hit Japan, and as of Monday, August 22nd, two of them are still active. What's at risk from wind and flooding is millions of tons of black bags full of radioactive materials that could be washing into the Pacific Ocean. A rare acknowledgement by Japan's labor ministry of the dangers at Fukushima when a man who developed leukemia by helping in cleanup efforts at the destroyed remains of the Fukushima nuclear power plant was granted work-related compensation. This marks only the second such case since the 2011 nuclear disaster began. The Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare recognized that the cancer was due to exposure to radiation at the facility and said the government will cover his medical expenses. Now, what about the kids with thyroid cancer and thyroid nodules? And everyone else. And in Berlin, a Japanese high school student addressed the UN Conference on Disarmament in Geneva on Tuesday, August 16, stressing the need to pay attention to the inhumanity of nuclear weapons. Nanako Nagaishi, a third grade student from Nagasaki, said, I am certain that the united power of young people such as ourselves will be able to move people throughout the world in the direction of nuclear disarmament. A similar group of Japanese students have gone to the United Nations every year since 1998. And we still have nuclear weapons. Internationally speaking, the United States has started transferring nuclear weapons stationed in Turkey to Romania according to Euractiv.com. Since the Cold War, some 50 U.S. tactical nuclear weapons have been stationed at Turkey's Incirlik Air Base, approximately 100 kilometers, or 62 miles, from the Syrian border. During the failed coup in Turkey in July, Incirlik's power was cut, and the Turkish government prohibited U.S. aircraft from flying in or out. Whether the U.S. could have maintained control of the weapons in the event of a protracted civil conflict in Turkey is an unanswerable question. So according to this report, six days ago, the U.S. began moving nuclear weapons from Turkey to Romania. And five days ago, Romania said, ain't happening here, to be continued. Customs authorities in Jingdao, East China's Shandong province, detained 14 people for smuggling frozen seafood from Japan, including irradiated high-end seafood from waters near Fukushima Prefecture. The group has smuggled over 5,000 tons of frozen seafood, including shrimp and king crab, valued at $34.5 million U.S. into China over the past two years. 
Some of the high-end products were from Fukushima, one of 12 Japanese prefectures from which China has banned any seafood imports due to the contamination of their waters after the Fukushima nuclear accident in 2011. And now... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. The president of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, Michael Binder, has openly questioned whether a bombshell of an anonymous letter purportedly, isn't that a great spin word, purportedly written by specialists at the nuclear regulator alleging malfeasance, is part of a conspiracy theory from outsiders. But, At the same time, Michael Binder has nonetheless encouraged concerned employees to speak up. Yeah, dig it. I don't believe you. There's no little nuclear man behind the curtain. It's a conspiracy about outsiders, but hey, come over here, sit, have a cup of tea. Tell me what's on your mind. Of course, the letter was sent anonymously because the letter writers admit that they are remaining anonymous because they are not confident of whistleblower protection. Can you blame them? Michael Binder led a series of jokes ridiculing the whistleblowers. And then the very next day, at the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission public meeting, the Greenpeace Canada senior energy strategist, Sean Patrick Stencil, who had been invited to speak about nuclear safety issues, was not allowed to comment about this letter, because Binder cut off his microphone. The commission also declined to review Stencil's 26-page analysis of the safety issues raised in the anonymous letter. Greenpeace's Stencil, by the way, has researched nuclear safety policy issues for more than a decade and testifies frequently before federal panels about the issue. So a letter about problems with the safety culture and the withholding of evidence necessary to make safety commissions from the commission itself is dismissed because the people will not come forward and make themselves known as the writers because they are afraid of retaliation at the same time that the person who's doing all of this manipulation is retaliating. And that's why Michael Binder and anybody who pays attention to him and lets him have sway in this issue, you are this week's Nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. We'll have this week's featured interview in just a moment. But first, the Excellence in Journalism Conference is only three weeks away. This is where I will get to schmooze and lobby more than 1,000 reporters, news directors, syndicators, and all manner of news professionals on behalf of nuclear issues. While I'm looking forward to going to New Orleans for this conference, I am getting a little nervous because I'm still a few hundred dollars short of the extremely modest budget and need to keep fundraising to cover the expenses. So, won't you help? Your donation of any size will be greatly appreciated. Anything from the equivalent of a cup of coffee to a winning lottery ticket. If you enjoy Nuclear Hot Seat and count on it for nuclear news and maybe even an unexpected laugh or two. Help me secure the rest of the money that is needed to do this trip upright. We've made it easy. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. You can donate by PayPal, use your credit or debit card, and if you prefer the old-fashioned way by sending a check, Send an email to me at info at nuclearhotseat.com and I will, by return email, get you a snail mail address where you can respond. Whatever you can do to help, know that you've got my gratitude and you will be part of making this extraordinary, potential-filled experience happen. Lou Ricciuti has been a nuclear researcher, writer, and speaker for nearly 20 years. He's been mentored by Nobel laureates and received commendation from the U.S. Department of Energy for identifying previously unidentified local manufacturing facilities involved in the earliest days of the atomic age. Previously, Lou worked in the Niagara Falls tourism and travel industry. 
having at one time been a board of directors member of the multi-million dollar Niagara Falls Convention and Visitors Bureau. But since discovering and publicizing some of Niagara's dirty nuclear secrets, Lou, no surprise here, no longer works in tourism and is now considered an expert in nuclear science and the associated waste stream created by his city's vast involvement in the earliest days of the atomic age. Especially if you've been following the radiation contamination issues raised in North St. Louis by Coldwater Creek and the Westlake Landfill, you're going to find some startling parallels in the story of what happened, radiologically speaking, in Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls! Lou Ricciuti, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby, and thanks for having me on your show. You used to work in the Niagara Falls Tourism and Travel Agency, having at one time been a board member of the Niagara Falls Convention and Visitors Bureau. Yet, in more recent years, you have become an expert in the problems of nuclear contamination in the area. What sparked your interest in this nuclear waste issue, and how did that impact your job? The visitors that come to Niagara Falls, I don't like calling them tourists. That evokes an image of sandals with black socks and loud shirts and too many cameras. And I have always thought of the people that come to Niagara Falls as visitors or my guests. And once I discovered that Niagara had this heinous radiological problem, it became very difficult to continue to invite people into my hometown. And the example would be, if I were to invite you to my home for dinner, and I knew that my kitchen was contaminated and it might cause you harm, I probably shouldn't invite you to dinner anymore. And that was a turning point for me. That and on September 6th of 2000, there was a three-day front-page top-fold series of articles in the USA Today newspaper entitled Poisoned Workers, Poisoned Places. And what this article outlines back in September 6th, 7th, and 8th of 2000 were three cities in America that had handled nuclear materials in complete secrecy. And two out of those three secret cities were located, A, was Niagara Falls, New York, and B, was another little town called Lockport, New York, about 15 miles to my east. When I began to do the research into what these articles meant, I started to see that we were very much kept in the dark as residents. And that really was, is what stimulated my interest in the subject. How did Niagara Falls become involved with the nuclear industry? How far back does it go? The current records that I work from, that I do my research from, go back to about 1942, the beginning days of the Manhattan Project. However, there there is evidence and other documents that show that Niagara was involved earlier than 1942, going back into the late 30s. Niagara was a pinnacle area of nuclear production and experimentation for a couple of reasons. One is that we had vast amounts of electricity due to the Niagara Falls hydroelectric plants. Also, we had early incarnations of chemical industries and metallurgical industries located here. So when the government decided to pursue the fission process, whether that was reactor or weapons, the government didn't actually own any factories of its own, and they didn't have experts in these various fields. So they had to turn to a location that had the power, the industry, and the knowledge. And it just so happens, unfortunately, for myself and our local residents, that that location was here in Niagara Falls. What sort of work was being done in the area by these early manifestations of the nuclear industry? Well, the principal activities that happened here were the separation and concentration of uranium ore. The ore from around the world, Canada, the Yukon Territories, the tri-states area of the southwest, Utah, Colorado, and I believe New Mexico, all of those places provided raw uranium ore that was then refined down into its metallic state. Uranium is not unlike other metals that we're more familiar with that are stable, such as iron and steel and copper and those sorts of materials. The same process is involved in turning those rock-like ore into metals. Uranium was the one of particular interest, and when the United States found that there was a vast supply of African Congolese ore, 
that was one of the materials that was refined and processed here at Niagara. That was the uranium from the Belgian Congo that had been shipped over prior to World War II so the Nazis wouldn't get their hands on it? One and the same. It was stored on Staten Island for a period of time. Then it wound its way up here to Niagara and also to a place called Port Hope, Ontario. At first, we were tasked by the government, the Manhattan Project to be specific, we were tasked with taking these uh, metallic ores and turning them actually into metal ingots. The different shapes of metal have different names, and believe it or not, it's ingots, derbies, dingbats is one of them, believe that or not. (laughs) And um, yeah, perfect for the nuclear industry. Nuclear dingbats, couldn't say it better myself. And because of our expertise in creating these metals, We also had the ability here to conduct experiments that the government also tasked us with. We played around with virtually every radioactive isotope that was on the periodic table from 1942 onward. What was done with the results of these experiments and this purification process? Where was it shipped and what did the uranium so refined and so processed turn into? We not only provided the uh, uranium for the plutonium reactors at Hanford, Washington, and as you know, but I'm not sure if all of your listeners would know this, but I'll throw it into the wash. Plutonium is created inside of a running uranium reactor. So in essence, if you follow the timeline of the nuclear age, there needed to be a uranium reactor first, and then plutonium is created inside of that while it's fissioning. It's actually a waste product, and it collects on the reactor rods and then it's stripped out and concentrated itself. But Niagara handled virtually every material, and I say that not cavalierly, I say that after nearly two decades of research. If you recall the movie Silkwood with Karen Silkwood, one of the scenes in the movie, they have their hands in a glove box and they're mixing powdered plutonium to be put into pellet form and then encased in the um, nuclear reactor rods. Well, that process was actually developed and perfected right here in Niagara Falls. How much of this information was known by the government and the population in this area? Well, the government knew about this basically from the start. And the population, I hate to say that they knew nothing, but because these projects were on a need-to-know basis, and most of them carrying top secret or higher levels of security, Virtually no resident knew. It wasn't until the waste materials started to rear their ugly heads here with contamination of properties and illness in people that people more so locally became cognizant of what had taken place here. My mission that I've taken on on these very narrow shoulders that I have is to educate as many of the people of my area and elsewhere around the country and the world that Niagara played a, a major role in the production and experimentation with these materials. Let's get back to the issue of the waste. How was it handled? Where has it shown up? Since when has the public become or started to become aware of it? Well, the material, it's sort of been a a bane locally, both from the time that it was disposed of and throughout the course of the last 50, 60, 70 years, it keeps popping up in roadways and in people's driveways and in their yards and in commercial development projects. In fact, uh, there was an article published today in Niagara Falls. We have a section of roadway, well, not the first, probably a mile long or more, that has more than 13 spots of nuclear contamination in the road that will need to be addressed. We've had other roads. There have been two miles, three miles, four miles of roadway that was underlaid with these nuclear materials. It's not uncommon. It may sound like a very unique situation, but unfortunately, this has occurred elsewhere in the country and around the world where nuclear waste became such a headache for the producers that it was disposed of in very cavalier fashion. It was, you know, dumped into creeks and streams. And the newspaper today that this is a front page article in the Niagara Falls Reporter, a weekly paper in Niagara Falls, and it's talking about this particular roadway and that. It's scheduled to be repaved. However, there's been no mention by officials, regulatory or the local administration, that there's anything to do with radioactivity in the road. So, you know, they're trying to skirt the issue and minimize it and 
the interesting thing is lately they've, the city officials have been calling these materials quote unquote safe. And the big argument that I've been trying to pose is that there are no nuclear materials that are safe in any form, in any fashion, in, in any location. The public started to become aware of this. About a year after I became aware, I started to bring information and documents and past government surveys to the local editors of the um, major newspapers, one in Niagara Falls and one in Buffalo, and I seemed to have gotten the runaround. I would show what I considered to be pretty damning evidence of what took place here, and every time I met with an editor, they said, well, bring me more information. I'm not averse to that. I'm pretty well aware that everything needs to be corroborated. So after a number of months of bringing pretty earth-shattering information to these editors, I started to become quite frustrated with the whole ordeal. And I was discussing it with a friend of mine who said that he knew an editor in Buffalo of a weekly called Art Voice, A-R-T-V-O-I-C-E. And over the course of 15 years, we did a series of articles called The Bomb That Fell on Niagara. And it sort of outlined the industrial history how these things first took place. And that raised the level of awareness to some degree of the local population here in Western New York, because these materials were handled, I like to call it an inter-office memo, where um, you, know, you have the manila envelope with a string and it gets sent to one office and they work on a document and then they send it off to another office and it gets worked on some more. And the materials that were handled here in Western New York were somewhat like that, where one facility, one manufacturing company had the expertise to do X. And then right down the road, there was another manufacturing company that had the expertise to do Y. So in today's paper that I mentioned, there's a quote that I'm very fond of. Well, in one sense, I'm fond of it. As a human being, it's not all that nice. And that is that Niagara Falls is the oldest, most widespread and unaddressed contamination, perhaps in all the nation. So as, as I said, again, you know, my mission is to get the public aware and then hopefully to have regulators address some of these issues. Have there been any epidemiological studies to figure out what the health impact has been on, say, cancer incident? Well, Levy, we have one of the highest cancer rates in the nation, but it's not just cancer. As you know, the exposure to ionizing radiation one of the very first things that happens is the suppression of the immune system. And once your immune system is reduced, it opens up your body, it opens up the biology for all sorts of problems, cancer being one of them. But within this area, there's huge cases of solid form tumors, kidney disease, brain diseases, heart disease, pretty much the entire spectrum of what you would expect to see in an area that had been contaminated by radiation. Now. As far as epidemiological studies go, there have been some that have been done through the years, but of course the health people, regulators, they like to say that it's a small group and it's not accurate and that sort of thing. As an anecdote, I think that there's a couple very powerful studies that have been done, and one of them is something that I completed by studying about 10 years of the morbidity, the obituaries locally and found some great trends in these diseases that can be directly tied to the nuclear business. Now, when you try and find these health maladies, statistically speaking, there's some, you know, some things that you need to look for. You need to look for age. You need to look for where the person lived, where they worked. And over the course of 10 years, I put together uh, enough statistics, and I sent it off to a, a couple of scientists, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, for their opinion. And in one year, 2012, I had discovered that out of a population here in the entire county of Niagara, which is about 200,000 people, that there's roughly 150 people or more a year that die from what could be attributed to their exposures to ionizing radiation here, chronic exposures. For instance, on my way to this interview today, which is being conducted from one of the high-rise glass office buildings right in the heart of downtown Niagara Falls, when I leave my home, it is impossible for me to avoid a landfill, a waste site. It's literally covering the entire landscape here around Niagara, the most 
famous one, of course, being Love Canal. But um, even Love Canal was not cleaned up. It was fenced off and a cap was put on it and some drainage system around it. But, yeah, it's pretty much ubiquitous around here. What is being done and what can be done in terms of cleanup? Levy, unfortunately, what's being done here is rather amateurish on one hand, and it's also criminal on on the other hand, in so much that local officials realizing that this is another black eye for Niagara Falls, not unlike Love Canal, but far greater, with all due respect to the people of Love Canal, because I worked there, I played there, I had friends that were victims of Love Canal, so this is with all due respect, but, you know, these materials are There's more landfills than you could put on a map, basically. You'd fill the map up with identification points for these landfills locally. And what's being done by local officials is that when when a site is found to be contaminated with radiation, rather than addressing it forthright, there will be piecemeal attempts to sweep it under the carpet, so to speak. And at least in my estimation and some other knowledgeable folks, they're creating a bigger problem than what they had in the first place. So by calling these things cleanups, you really have to put quotation marks around it because I I call them silent and quiet cleanups. While they're saying that they're going to do a road repaving job, what they're actually doing is digging out radioactive materials and trying to send them away quietly. And by repaving, you could just say that that is another form, a literal form of cover-up. Oh, without a doubt. Absolutely without a doubt. They're fearful of a second black eye, Love Canal being the first major one nationwide and internationally. And this one, because of the nature of the material being nuclear wastes, I believe that local officials are even more frightened of this, both through ignorance and through economic expediency, that, you know, they're willing to do anything that's on the wrong path. So by highlighting these things and writing about them and telling people about what really is taking place here, hopefully that spotlight will cause some good to happen. And and again, I appreciate you inviting me onto your show. I believe that your show is a very important piece of the, the knowledge pie having to do with the nuclear situation that we have in America and elsewhere. Thank you for that. Now, you did work for the tourism and travel industry in Niagara Falls. Is that your current professional path, or have you parted ways? No, Levy, I no longer work in the tourism industry, and I was very much involved for a long period of time, and it's a job that I loved. I loved meeting people from around the world. I loved having an opportunity to welcome them to my home rather than tourists as my guests. Unfortunately, once I discovered these things, that really took the wind out of my sails for about a 25-year career in tourism. As I said, I I no longer wish to invite people to my kitchen if they're going to get sick. What I find amazing about this is how similar the story is to what the people in North St. Louis are going through with the Westlake landfill and the waste there from the Rallencroft facility and so many other places where there has been manufacturing done or purification of materials done, but without any kind of proper cleanup of nuclear's dirty little secret, which is the waste that gets created. And here we are with the place that people come to to celebrate their weddings and hopefully start their families where they may be exposing themselves to radioactive contamination. So if there are people either in the Niagara Falls area, in New York State, or elsewhere, who wish to get involved with this issue, where can they go and what can they do to support you in your efforts? Well, the first thing that I would request, you know, ask that anyone who has interest in this subject, finding out more about Niagara's dirty nuclear secrets, is to do searches having to do with the word Niagara Falls, the words Niagara Falls, atomic waste, Niagara Falls, Manhattan Project, And do the bone-up thing where you become a little more knowledgeable. I think it's important that all the cities that have been involved are completely aware of of each other. I'm I'm quite aware of St. Louis having worked for the St. Louis Cardinals for a short period of time. Yes, you're absolutely correct. They are similar, and the government does treat them very similar as far as trying to uh, hush things up. Maybe we need to unify the people in St. Louis and the people in Niagara Falls. If anyone would like to become involved or, you know, they want more information, 
or if they wish to contact me, I think that we could probably arrange for that. Do you have a website or an email address that people can use to reach out? Sure. If they like, they could uh, send an email to, this is one word, Niagara Net, and it's spelled N-I-A-G-A-R-A-N-E-T, Niagara Net at AOL.com. And that would come directly to me. Lou, I want to thank you so much for the work that you've been doing for all of these years because all it takes is one motivated, diligent, dogged activist in any area to really flip on the light switch and show what is going on, what has gone, and what needs to take place to start addressing the overwhelming nuclear problem that we have in this country that's specifically created by the waste. And this is what you have been doing for, as you said, close to 20 years. Well, I appreciate the accolades and the support because there are a lot of dark days when you're looking into these things. A lot of folks have a bad uncle, someone in their family that they don't like to talk about. And that happens to be the case here with the subject of nuclear materials at Niagara Falls. It's like bad Uncle Sal that no one wants to talk about, but it doesn't change him. So that's the mission is to change them. It's funny. Sometimes this is very frustrating, and I would encourage anyone who's interested in doggedly pursuing these things to do so. And maybe as an anecdotal uh, measure here, there, there have been times when I've told my associates and friends and family members that, There are days where I wish that I had discovered a different flavor of beer instead of these things. But since this is what it is, and this is what I've discovered and found out about this community, that's what changed the career path right there. Well, we're grateful to you for that willingness to change your path, for the willingness to be aware and to share that information, as well as for being my guest this week, Lou Ricciuti. On Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Levy. That was nuclear researcher, writer, and speaker Lou Ricciuti. The easiest way to contact Lou is through his Facebook page, and we will have a link up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 270. Activist shout out! Veteran anti nuclear activist Myla Reason brought to my attention an important Diablo Canyon anniversary that deserves our attention. On Monday, August 25th, 2014, two years ago, some really startling news came to light. The senior resident inspector for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Dr. Michael Peck, had written a differing professional opinion about PG&E's decrepit Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. And basically, he was saying that they were in violation of their license because the plant, the 1960s designed plant, had not been engineered to withstand the kind of ground motion that could occur. He said specifically in his differing professional opinion that it was outside the bounds of the existing Diablo Canyon design basis and safety analysis. And, and, you know, translated, it simply means that it could not withstand the kind of ground motion that might occur. And he said that it should be shut down until pg and could prove that it could withstand the kind of ground motion that could occur or an earthquake that was very possible. Now, this all came about because the shoreline fault was mapped and discovered in 2008. Diablo Canyon sits in an area that is riddled with earthquake faults, and the newest fault, the shoreline fault, was shown to be very close to the intake for the water that comes out of the ocean that is used, I mean, gargantuan amounts of water that's used to cool the reactors. And it was so close when it was mapped that Dr. Michael Peck thought that he should examine the design of the plant closely and make a determination about it. And in part because in 2009, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they evaluated it and said that, oh, everything's fine. 
And he's the one who took a closer look and said, well, not so fast. Not okay. It really needs to be shut down. And his differing professional opinion was suppressed for quite a long time. And it finally came to light in August of 2014. This happened over years. I mean, we've all known for years, we knew before Diablo opened that it was sited in an area riddled with faults, 13 faults that we know of now. And not all that far from the San Andreas Fault, the big fault, which is 45 miles away, but this shoreline fault was within, I believe, 300 meters from the intake for the water that comes in to cool the reactors. And when he looked at the plans for the plant and looked at the fault, he came to the conclusion that it simply wasn't safe and that Diablo should be shut until PG&E could prove that it could actually withstand the kind of ground motion that could occur. This is huge for many of us who believe that the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission is simply not fulfilling its statutory mandate to ensure protection of public health and safety by virtue of its inspection and licensing program. Dr. Michael Peck, who works for him, was trying to do his job, and he was stopped, and his dissent was dismissed, and he was transferred to Tennessee. How long was Dr. Peck's information repressed, and what brought it to the surface two years ago? Michael Peck offered his differing professional opinion in July of 2013. It was leaked to the press and made public by the Associated Press on Monday, August 25th, 2014, two years ago. So it was suppressed for 13 months before it saw the light of day. Following this revelation, Senator Barbara Boxer convened hearings on the earthquake risks at Diablo. These revelations came about in August, and I believe it was in November or December of 2014 that Barbara Boxer, Senator Barbara Boxer, who at that time was the ranking member of the Democratic Party of that committee, convened hearings to assess the earthquake risks, and she brought forth a number of witnesses. It's worth going back and reviewing some of the stunning testimony that was offered by Dan Hirsch out of Santa Cruz. He basically recounted what had been happened, what suppressed, and he reiterated and made an eloquent case for shutting Diablo until PG&E could prove that it's safe. Now, fast forward, we have just uh, arrived at a deal where we're being told that Diablo should run until 2025, nine years, where we have to risk this horrendous meltdown that could be triggered by an earthquake at any time during the next nine years. Is there any avenue of action that can be taken to speed up the closure of Diablo so we don't have to keep our fingers crossed, very bad nuclear policy, keep our fingers crossed, for the next nine years? Well, of course. There's lots that we can do. We've got to make noise. We've got to organize. Call your senators and your congressmen on the national level and say that our Nuclear Regulatory Commission is not fulfilling its statutory mandate to ensure protection of public health and safety by virtue of its inspection and licensing programs. It is allowing... California to be subjected to this horrendous risk. You know, if they would talk about how they're acting prudently, and they're not. They're risking so much, and it's all driven by money and greed, and it is not driven by any kind of responsible action to actually protect us. I mean, we don't need the power. It's excess power. We can make it we can have as much energy as we need if we conserve, if we switch to renewables. We don't need this risk of nuclear nightmare. It's just reckless and irresponsible.
We've got to make noise on every level of government. We've got to get out in the street. We've got to make comments. We've got to make this a visible issue because we're invisible and we're not heard. We're not seen. We're not heard. And we need to really make a lot of noise about this. That was Myla Reason. Myla just posted her latest video, which is of Harvey Wasserman, known to some as the Pied Piper of our No Nukes movement. At a gathering in Santa Monica, California, on Sunday, August 21st, 2016, Harvey spoke about the pressing need to shut PG&E's decrepit Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant down once and for all. You can find Myla's video of Harvey's talk on her YouTube channel under Myla Reason, which is a really cool channel to subscribe to. And, of course, we'll have it up on our website, NuclearHotSeat.com under this episode, number 270. Another video that will also be on the site is from Helen Caldicott, who spoke in San Francisco last week and, as always, was brilliant and inspiring. Check it out. And finally, a loss to all activists, which is probably intentional. I bring you the sad news that CNN Money no longer supports their website where you could determine how far away from a nuclear reactor you lived. You used to be able to enter your zip code and, ta-da, push a button and all relevant nuke information showed up. I guess the honchos at CNN Money decided they no longer wanted to help our side prove how close those nukes really are. Nothing like being up close and personal with the danger. Meanwhile, There are other websites being built by members of our community that are going to provide this service. Hopefully one of them will incorporate that level of zip code-based functionality because it was really cool. Meanwhile, I'm bombarding CNN Money with email asking them, Nu? Was machst du? There's a problem here? If I ever get a response from them, I'll let you know what it is. Here's today's final thought. Ecological problems are not new. Anton Chekhov was a Russian playwright who was also a country doctor. He wrote Uncle Vanya in 1897, and the work is autobiographical regarding many aspects of Chekhov's life, particularly in this speech, given by the doctor, in which Chekhov shows us his deep concern about the environment, as relevant today as it was in 1897. Yes, sometimes we cut wood out of necessity. But why be wanton? Why? Our forests fall before the X. Billions of trees all perishing. The homes of birds and bees being laid waste. The level of rivers fall, and they dry up. Sublime landscapes disappear, never to return. Because we don't have sense enough to bend down and pick up fuel from the ground. What must human beings be to destroy what they can never create? God has given us reason, power, and thought. What do we use these powers for but waste? We destroyed our forests. Our rivers run dry. Our wildlife is all but extinct, our climate ruined, and every day, every day, wherever one looks, life is more hideous. Ma, I see, you think me amusing. I am hideous, eccentric, the thoughts of some poor eccentric, someone naive too, you might think. But I pass by that forest that I saved from the axe, and I hear that forest sighing. I planted that forest. I think things may be in our power. Do you understand? Perhaps the climate itself is in our control. Why not? And if in a thousand years people are happy, I will play a small part in that happiness. I plant a birch tree, and I watch it take root. 
It grows. It sways in the wind. And I feel such pride. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, August 23rd, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from deunrenard.wordpress.com, japantimes.co.jp, asahi.com, enenews.com, niagarafallsreporter.com, miningawareness.wordpress.com, syracuse.com, capecodtimes.com, and the excellent ongoing coverage by Christine Legere, latimes.com, youractive.com, uatoday.tv, sputniknews.com, fukuleaks.org, globaltimes.cn, theglobeandmail.com, nationalobserver.com, popularresistance.org, huffingtonpost.com, ecowatch.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the fantastic, passionate, and highly motivated anti-nuclear activists from all over the world who gather at Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook where you are invited to join us and like us and share our posts with your family and friends. Did I bother to mention that we're all cute, too? Thanks also to Jane Damien for bringing Chekhov's Uncle Vanya's speech to our attention. Theme music written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, on NewsZSentinel.com, and now broadcast on WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. We're always looking for other stations and networks to connect with, so if you know an online news aggregator or community radio station that would like to carry the show, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. If you wish to look back and not turn into a pillar of salt, check out the archive of 269 programs on the website NuclearHotSeat.com. We also have a whole bunch of them up on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos and on iTunes under Podcasts. If you sign up on the website in the big yellow form box, you, yes you, will receive an emailed link to each week's Nuclear Hot Seat episode. As a bonus, you will also receive a chapter from my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond. The chapter deals with what it was like to be on the ground and know that one mile away, a nuclear reactor is misbehaving really badly. The full book is available on Amazon. And a reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news and will also help get me and keep me fed at the Excellence in Journalism Conference in New Orleans in September. So please, do what you can this week to help us out with the donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is downloaded every month In 112 countries, we activists are not alone, and we are linking. And that's because we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So nobody go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Niagara Falls! Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.